Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ninth episode of the IJC, an online journal club brought to you by the ESERS. Here, we aim to discuss the latest research with an expert panel with two main aims, to refine your knowledge uh, on our research methods and also your practice in cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery by discussing the latest evidence. I would like to start by introducing myself, my co-host, and our expert speakers tonight. My name is Artemis Matsu, and I'm a cornea and refractive fellow at Queen Victoria Hospital at East Greenstead, UK. My co-host is Dr. Basak bostan Siseran, who is an assistant professor in ophthalmology in Okan University School of Medicine in Istanbul, Turkey, and a fellow young ophthalmologist. And it's our great pleasure to welcome our faculty, Mr. Samir Hamada, who is a consultant corneal and refractive surgeon and the lead of the corneoplastic unit at Queen Victoria Hospital at East Greenstead, UK. And Mr. Arthur Cummings, who is a medical director at the Wellington Eye Clinic and head of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Beacon Hospital in Dublin, Ireland and also a member of the ESCRS Practice Management and Development Committee. Welcome both, and thank you very much for accepting our invite. It's our great pleasure to have you both with us tonight. So I'll just start by introducing our paper for tonight. So this is the paper we're discussing, Visual Outcomes and Corneal Biomechanics After V4C Implantable Columnar Lens Implantation in Subclinical Keratoconus. Before we proceed, I'll just share our housekeeping tips with you, especially for those who haven't joined us before. I would like to remind you that all attendees are muted throughout the entire presentation to avoid any background noise, but uh, we welcome your participation and questions through the Q&A button, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask any questions and our expert speakers will be more than happy to answer them for you. In fact, it is a great opportunity to take advantage of their expertise in this field. A recording of today's IJC will be available on the ESCRS Facebook page and YouTube channel. Now, I will hand over to Basak to run our poll questions for the audience. Basak, over to you. Thank you, Artemis, and welcome, everyone. Can we have the questions, please? Okay, our first question is, do you use implantable columnar lenses in your practice, yes or no? Okay, um, and our second question, please. How confident are you while you're diagnosing a subclinical keratoconus based on corneal tomography? Are you confident and you know exactly which parameters or indices to use to distinguish normal versus subclinical keratoconus? Or you are not confident there are so many different indices and you don't know which ones are more reliable? This is confession time. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Our third question, please. Are you using any technology other than topography or tomography to detect keratoconus? Okay, a very interesting question is coming. Do you think keratoconus can be unilateral? Yes or no? Okay. Uh, very close numbers. We are going to be discussing this in detail. And our last question, please. Keratoconus suspect, borderline keratoconus, subclinical keratoconus, and form frost keratoconus, and early keratoconus. Can these terms are uh, um, these terms are the same to you and can be used interchangeably, or these terms are incorrectly used interchangeably? And clear di diagnostic criteria should be set for more uniform while reporting in the literature. What do you think? Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Pastor. Back to you, Artemis. Thank you. I think the last question, especially maybe our speakers want to comment on that later in our discussion. Um, so I'll just briefly summarize the paper for those who haven't had the chance to uh, have a look at it. So this is the paper uh, we're talking about tonight, and it was published at the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery in October 2020 by Lee and colleagues. Uh, so the authors aim to evaluate the safety, efficacy, stability, predictability, and corneal biomechanical properties in eyes with subclinical keratoconus that uh, had a V4C ICL implantation. And this was a retrospective case series. Now, regarding the technology that the authors used to conduct this study, obviously they relied on uh, parameters taken from corneal tomography, the pentacum, as we all know it. Uh, but they also used uh, another device, which is called Corvis, and it stands for Corneal Visualization and it's a shine flume technology tonometer. And this is actually one of the two commercially available devices that are capable of measuring corneal biomechanics in vivo, the other one being Aura, the ocular response analyzer. And how does that how, how does that happen? So it assesses the corneal dynamic response to an air puff using ultra high speed shine flume camera. And it provides several dynamic corneal response parameters in the various phases of corneal deformation, as you can see. It provides a number of different parameters, actually, but we will focus on the ones that the authors used uh, in, their, in their study. So as you can see, that was the corneal stiffness, uh, integrated radius, the ambrosial relational thickness, and the deformation amplitude. The next, uh, the next uh, image is from Pentagon corneal tomography. And at the bottom of this image, you see combined indices, combined parameters taken both from Corvis and Pentacam. And this is the Corvis Biomechanical Index, the CBI, uh, the Tomographic and Biomechanical Index, TBI, and the BADD display, which is from Pentacam. And actually, the author state, and it has been shown in other studies, that the CBI and TBI scores are highly sensitive to detect preclinical or subclinical keratoconus as well. This is the lens that they implanted. So this is the vision ICL lens from Star Surgical. So you can see uh, they spit it in the ciliary sulcus and uh, it's a central hole. That's a newer design with a central hole. Uh, so it improves the aqueous humor circulation and you don't have to do a peripheral iridotomy when you implant it. Now, in terms of their study group, so the authors state that they included eyes with subclinical keratoconus and how did they define that? So they defined as an abnormal tomography, um, eyes with a posterior corneal elevation at thinnest point of more than 15 millimeters, and an ART max of less than 339, and the ABCD cases staging score more than zero. So they relied the definition according to their methodology to corneal uh, tomography. And this is the table with their demographic characteristics. So we see that we're talking about young patients. So a range of ages from 21 to 35, mean age is 27. The mean refracted spherical equivalence minus 7.42. And you can see a few baseline uh, clinical uh, parameters and uh, preoperative uh, corpus parameters as well. Now going through their, their results one by one in terms of efficacy. So they uh, proved that their study has, has a high efficacy index, their uh, treatment has a high efficacy index, and that is measured with a post-operative uncorrected distance visual acuity uh, to the uh, preoperative corrected distance visual acuity, and that was higher 1.19. Um, and that essentially shows that there's significant improvement in corrected and uncorrected distance vision uh, after the treatment. In terms of safety, uh, again, the safety index, which is the ratio of post-operative corrected distance visual acuity to pre-operative corrected distance visual acuity, was high at 1.24, which means that it's a safe treatment, and that you can see from the chart as well. So 85% of their patients had uh, gained uh, one line or more, or more of correct distance VA in Snellen lines, and they had no cases that lost a line of, or more of vision. And also, there was no significant uh, endothelial cell loss uh, up to two years. Predictability. So you can see on the uh, scattered plot of achieved versus attempted spherical equivalent refraction that most of the values are on target or within the one diopter um, range, so plus minus one diopter. Only very few uh, cases are on the um, borderline outliers towards the undercorrected side, uh, no overcorrected patients, so their outcomes are on target. And you can tell that from here as well. So they show that 95% uh, of their eyes uh, were within one diopter of uh, uh, the targeted spherical equivalent at two years of follow-up. And this next image is the double angle plot uh, where you see the post-operative refractive astigmatism prediction. 
And most of the values fall within the blue ellipsoid, which means that that's the 0.5 diopter and, and therefore 97% of, their, of the eyes uh, had an astigmatism of less than 0.5 diopters at two years. Now, how stable the results were, very stable. At six months, one year, and two years, uh, there was no significant difference in the spherical equivalent. And lastly, regarding the corneal biomechanical properties, so the authors in this table uh, give us a, a number of, of parameters that they use, both from corneal tomography and from the corvus, and that's preoperative at six months, 12 months, and 24 months after treatment. And we can see that there's no significant variation in these uh, values, which they conclude means that the surgery itself did not compromise biomechanical properties of the cornea. So their conclusion is that uh, we already know, obviously, that ICL is a safe and effective treatment for stable keratoconic patients, and that the combined parameters taken from um, corneal tomography and from Corvus have a good predictive accuracy to diagnose subclinical keratoconus. And what this paper adds is that the refractory results after V4C ICL or toric ICL implantation in patients with subclinical keratoconus are stable at follow-ups up to two years, and also that the corneal biomechanical factors were not affected by the surgery itself. So this is the uh, summary of the paper. And uh, I will uh, hand over to Basak now to start uh, questioning our experts. Thank you very much, Artemis. Uh, Professor Hamada, I would like to ask uh, a quest question to you regarding the methodology of the paper. Uh, do you agree with the author's definition of subclinical keratoconus? They said uh, they defined abnormal tomography as posterior elevation at the thinnest point more than 15 millimeters and um, maximum ambrosial relational thickness less than 339. Uh, with the Bellin ABCD keratoconus staging score more than zero. And they said they conducted a retrospective case series of patients who has keratoconic uh, eyes in one eye and a topographically normal fellow eye as uh, they were labeled as subclinical keratoconus. What do you think about this definition? Well, well, first of all, I have to say, I mean, the, the paper is well written for sure. When it comes to methodology, I find a little bit, there is a bit of lack of clarity I think uh, when you write a paper, it's very important to define what, first of all, what's your aim, which they done it, how you're gonna run the paper, how you're gonna run the study to reach to, to get, uh, get the evidence of what you are looking for, kind of safety, efficacy evidence from your cohort. And you have to be very specific about defining each parameters. So when we're talking here about a subclinical keratoconus, I don't see there is a, a good clarity here about what do they mean by subclinical keratoconus. Uh, the definition in methodology is not exactly consistent throughout the paper because when they, in, throughout the discussion, suddenly they're talking about the biomechanical stability and what is the biomechanics of patients with subclinical keratoconus. So I would rather be clear throughout the whole paper from the start when we talk about the methods to say this is what subclinical uh, keratoconus, this is what we mean exactly both from the tomographic parameters and from the biomechanical data, because obviously they use the, the Corvus and they use the Pentacam. So I think that's that's area where a bit of gray was not very well defined, and that probably led to a confusion later in the paper. Uh, so that is one thing in terms of other things, but I think there's some self-criticism by the author himself about the, the with the methods that they, they wish the paper to be longer, because when you talk about keratoconus, especially if subclinical, I think two years, a bit too short time to judge whether there is a progression or not. So, uh, so otherwise, I think other elements of the methodology were fine to me. But what is your definition of a subclinical keratoconus? Uh, do you agree with their definition? Like a normal yeah. topography in one eye and a keratoconic eye in the other? Yeah. So if you look back and you think, so what's actually the real definition of subclinical keratoconus? Uh, you will find multiple definitions, not only one, and it depends on where was the paper done and what what kind of of of, uh, of uh, technology used to define what subclinical keratoconus. So, if you're talking about say ten-year-old technology, we were talking about the parameters on the pentacam and talking about the posterior elevation, anterior elevation, and uh, we used to say right, okay. Posterior elevation up to 17 millimeter, this is kind of suspicious. Once you hit 23 above, this is more keratoconus. When we talk about anterior elevation, we say above 17, uh, posterior elevation, it's, uh, it's more keratoconus. 13 to 17 is suspicious. And things obviously moved on. Now we have biomechanical data. So COVID has come to say 
we have a CBI, and CBI give you what's the subclinical. CBI tell you the normal from the keratoconic patients. Even better now, the TBI. So TBI obviously is the, is the one that is more sensitive to tell you that normal patient, normal eyes from the subclinical eyes. And, and that is where there is a bit of gray area to decide uh, are, what, where are these patients. I always may try to make things simple because if you look across all the definitions, there is one thing for sure. You have three types of corneas. You have the absolutely normal cornea. You have the cornea that is asymmetrical. There's some irregularity in that cornea, but it's the parameters are not high enough to confirm this is a keratoconus. So I, I wouldn't like to, 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 uh, to kind of <laughs> flood all this information with various definition to say this is subclinical. I think if the cornea is not keratoconic and have some, some uh, asymmetrical findings, it's a high suspicion. So, so I'll give you an example. If you don't have the corvus, for example, and you rely on topo topography, you might say, actually, this is suspicious cornea. But is that enough to say this subclinical keratoconus, especially if the other eye is 100% normal? Um, us, like myself and uh, Sir Cummings, we use the epithelium mapping, for example. That can give you some additional information to see if this is actually, those asymmetry on the cornea is high enough to say so just this is an abnormal cornea. Obviously, you might still be in a position you're not sure if this is healthy or subclinical. And then if you have the core base, the technology, suddenly you find yourself actually, yes, the, uh, the TBI, which is sensitive, obviously, and uh, highly sensitive to differentiate normal from subclinical. So in, in simple words to say, you do things by looking at all the clinical and topographical parameters you have, and then you make your judgment. We might still be wrong, to be honest, because suddenly if I bring you the COVID next day and test the same patient, you find actually I was wrong. This patient, is still, it looks like subclinical keratoconus. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, my second question will be for Dr. Cummings. Uh, would you like to see more information on how the authors define stability of keratoconus before proceeding to treatment? Because um, I don't think stable is clarified in the paper. What do you think about it? And um, one more question is, uh, what criteria do you use or what is your approach or protocol to confirm the stability before proceeding to such a treatment? Okay, that's a, it's, it's a bigger question than you anticipate, I think, is, you know, we belong to a group, some of the alternate group, maybe a 50 or 60 um, senior ophthalmologists who meet every year on the Friday night of ESCRS, the, the summer meeting, and it's called the Keratoconus Experts Group, and two things come up every time, and that is how unclear our definitions are of subclinical form throughs, um, suspicious corneas, so I actually think in this particular paper where they gave a parameter and said 15 microns of elevation and an art max of 339, I think was quite helpful. So it gave you an idea of, of what they were talking about. And then the second thing that always comes up in this paper is we don't have fantastic methodology at the moment um, to tell us whether someone's responding to cross-linking, where we actually see a change in the, the K values and the K max and whatever you're looking at, or if someone's progressing. So your question as to should they have checked someone's progressing? I think these eyes all had keratoconus in the one eye and basically no tomographic evidence of keratoconus in the second eye. So they've been following them for a while, figuring that there's um, no issue. They didn't mention rubbing. I'm quite sure they were made sure the patients weren't rubbing. I think most keratoconus experts would agree that um, rubbing plays a very big part in keratoconus. They didn't like to establish that. And I think they're in a very good position to go ahead and assume a, an eye that looks like that is fine to go ahead with surgery. You know, if we had no, nothing like cross-linking, if we didn't have a tool like that, it would be slightly different. But today we have a tool that if this eye did progress, we could certainly stop it. So I don't think that's a, it's a huge problem. Going forward, I think over the two year span that they looked at it, I think they used the tools at their disposal. In my own clinic, I'd love to hear what Sama thinks, is what we find most sensitive is the epithelial map. That seems to be the most um, sensitive tool for us. We don't have biomechanical um, devices like all this. Okay, so uh, I will have a second question for you. The youngest age at Im implantation in this study is 21. Do you think it is, it is, it is, or it is not too young to be sure that the keratoconus will not 
uh, progress in this patient. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. But I think, you know, you'd have to go back to, if you ask 10 keratoconus experts for their belief on how keratoconus works, I think they'll get 10 different opinions, 10 different variations. And your, your last poll question was, today was really good. It was, do you think keratoconus can exist unilaterally? And I think, I can't remember the answer, but I think 40% said maybe it can. But traditionally, if you ask someone a question like that, you think it could exist unilaterally, you'd, you'd fail your exam. I mean, people would say this is a bilateral condition and it almost always affects the second eye. I don't know if that's so true anymore. You know, with a lot of the work Damon got and has published, that shows how big a role it is. If someone's only rubbing the one eye and they develop keratoconus and then they don't rub the other eye, I mean, then it's very feasible that you won't get development in that eye. So um, I don't think it's too young. I think we have tools today like cross-linking and those corners are looking completely normal and I'd be very, very comfortable, especially with a, a tool like the ICL. We know exactly how safe it is, how well it works. Um, and these patients already are compromised and are psychologically affected sometimes by the fact that the one eye is doing so poorly and they get an amazing boost. This, this group was an average of minus 7.42. You know, look at the efficacy and safety of this procedure. You change their lives by giving them vision. It's a bit like glaucoma patients. This is another topic. But glaucoma patients who one day, somewhere along the line, someone says, you know, you can fix your vision if you like while you're about it. And you do a PRK or a LASIK and you fix their vision. And this, this trend of always going into the year, things are getting worse and worse and worse. Suddenly you can improve things. So I'd, I, I can't um, fault the way they've approached this. Okay, and uh, my last question will be, how long would you like to follow up a patient at a young age before proceeding to such a treatment? Like six months, stable, for saying stable. So if I see a patient that like, looks like their cohort, keratoconus uh -huh. one eye, yeah, I would probably watch it for a while. I mean, I first want to get the first eye under control. So we you see what's happening there, stop the rubbing, see if we need to cross lengthen. If we do, first stabilize things. Every time someone comes in, you're always checking both eyes anyway. And once you've got stability in the first eye, I think you can safely go in and, and um, do an eye study in both eyes. That's how I would see it. And you, Sama? Yeah, well, basically, I agree with you, but I probably, although the criteria for ICL from age 21 to 60, that's the, uh, the white paper says, however, I think with patients with keratoconus, I would be keen to wait a little bit until they're maybe 23, 24, at least give them like 20, two years of follow-up. Uh, actually, I just seen a patient today who is uh, suspicious keratoconus and they want ICL surgery. They, um, the, we've been following that patient for uh, 18 months now and it's been stable. Also, the first two scans were a little bit suspicious. Now it's, it looks like things are pretty stable. So we're just planning the surgery in the next couple of months. So I wouldn't say watch less than one year but ideally maybe 18 months to two years before I decide, yes, let's proceed. That's a really good point. I just want to clarify something, Basak, like if you don't mind, is um, I was assuming a group like this where there's keratoconus in the one eye, so you have been following them. Um, I wouldn't, if I see a patient for the first time today and have keratoconus in one eye and subclinically the other, suggest the ICL, absolutely not. You first want to see what the, what the keratoconic eye is doing and establish, um, I think ICL is really an elective procedure and it's, it's got potential to give you a really good outcome. So you want to ensure that it remains like that. The patient needs to be a good candidate. And I don't think STAR would recommend putting ICL into a, a corner that's changing. So I do think that makes a lot of sense. I'd certainly also suggest, yeah, probably two years. When we, when we combine laser with keratoconus and cross-linking, if we do just a topography-guided regularization, we never do it on a, anyone younger than 25. So we know as we get older, the corner gets stiffer and more rigid. So I think that's, I think for someone starting out, it's very good advice. Mm. And I give it yeah. time, follow at least for two years and see what's going on. Right. And I just want to add for, yeah. for the methodology, because uh, uh, Arthur, you asked this question about uh, the criteria they put. And I think it's from an academic point of view, uh, regardless of what they put, but as long as they put some parameters, it's really helpful for someone who wants to write a similar paper in future. So at least you can compare the results with their, because for example, this is in the Asian group, right? So you can come back, we'll do the same study in Latin group, right? And then you can report, but at least you know what you're comparing like to like. So yes, putting some figures in mythology is always helpful for academic purposes, obviously. Yeah. Mm. 
And um, Mr. Amara, obviously Mr. Kamis has already touched upon it, but would you want to have this information about the fellow eye, the keratoconic eye, whether it progressed during these two years, uh, was there any treatment done, um, whether there's any any particular habit like eye rubbing, as Mr. Ham- Cummings said, that has triggered it to the other eye. So would you like to have this information in the paper? Oh, definitely, especially when it is unilateral, <laughs> let's call it, okay, case, and uh, to see why they have one keratoconus in one eye. Because uh, I probably echo what uh, Mr. Cummings was saying. I don't think I've seen a unilateral keratoconus unless there is a kind of, uh, uh, you can't identify the reason usually. It's, it's either something inflammatory in that eye or they're really eye rubber in that side. That's uh, usually the case. Majority of the cases I, I always convince is bilateral. But yes, those cases there must be. So yes, it's a very valid question. You know, to know about their, are they etiopic? They have hay fever rubbing their eyes. Um, what's the history? Because those are all coming from the younger patients. They could have a VKC, they come in with etiopy, et cetera. So those all a very good question. And also, I don't know whether this patient, I'm, I'm not sure if I missed that, but I didn't read whether the patient had the treatment or they just observed as a stable keratoconus. So that's very important as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so yeah, many questions actually. I mean, it's not necessarily will, will add to the, uh, maybe the, the, the direction of the paper not to explore this ex- exact point, but I think it's helped the reader to know if I have a clinical clonus patient and they are subclinical, what should I do? To, yeah. yeah. And, and again, coming back to the methodology. So obviously they have set out five outcome measures, safety, efficacy, predictability, stability, corneal biomechanics. Do you think this is probably too much for this paper or should, yeah. they, should they have just narrowed down to primary yeah. and secondary end? Yeah, so those who knows me know my, I'm, I'm a simple and I like everything to be simple and not too complicated. But I think when it comes to paper, you have to be very, very clear and specific. I would rather, when you write a paper, to say, my primary outcome is X. So I would rather they said in this paper, our primary outcome is, say, safety, for example, or, or the efficacy. Then you got multiple secondary outcomes, which will cover all the other elements. But always to focus on one primary outcome, that's definitely works. And they managed to do it here in, as a retrospective paper. But if they're doing prospective study, especially if it's randomized control study, they can't, they can't do it so well if you have so many uh, primary outcomes. I mean, you need one, maximum two primary outcomes at most. Yeah. And um, Mr. Cummings, regarding their surgical technique, so that's actually one of their conclusions, that um, they noticed no difference in the corneal biomechanical properties because they did, despite the fact that they did a clear corneal incision. So just, just for the record, is that how you do the surgery yourself? Do you use a scleral incision or a clear cornea? And uh, if you do use a clear cornea, do you factor in that surgical induced astigmatism to your pre-op assessment? So we know from cataract surgery that temporal incisions tend to be a lot more stable and give less induced astigmatism than a, than a superior incision. So cataract surgery always do on axis. But with toric ICLs, because they, you know, they make it so easy, and we do everything from temporal. And I must, I must agree, we haven't really seen changes. In a keratoconic patient, you'd be slightly more concerned because the cornea could be, you know, less stable. But again, they showed very well. I think they had a reference paper where they used a 3-millimeter incision, and they used a 2.7, and we saw for ourselves over two years how stable it was. So I think when you do a corneal incision and the corneal horizontal diameter is slightly bigger than the, the vertical one, because that incision is, relatively speaking, that little bit further away from the central pupil, I, th- I think it's safe. Yeah, I don't do a scleral, I do a, a clear corneal too. Yeah. And then you, Mr. Hamad, do you do also do clear cornea? Yeah, no, I, I do clear cornea incision. Uh, like, yeah, like Arthur, always temporal. Uh, I have to say, for those patients with keratoconic, my approach is a little bit different in terms of post-op management. Those patients, they're not like the regular one-year follow-up. There are patients six-monthly follow-up. Um, the, just, and, and I'll always, when they come for the six-month check, we look at, we repeat their pentacam. It's not like just uh, the recommendation. Basically to, so for those who don't know, the ICL, every year, patient will come back for the um, cell count, corneal cell count, spectral microscopy, check the eye pressure and the vault of the lens. Here with keratoconic, you have to measure basically the, uh, the parameters, the cornea, make sure there's a cornea stability. I mean, the, the paper actually highlighted that they use their, obviously, Corvus to follow this patient for two years to check the biomechanical stability. We're using, the, we probably that's another thing we can talk about, but 
the, you have to use minimal data to make sure that actually this patient remains stable. And for us, we use Pentacam and the epithelium mapping. Yep, thank you. Basak, do you want to continue? Uh, yeah, I would like to ask a question. You, uh, you just said that uh, there will be some information needed in the postoperative period regarding the endothelial cell count and the vault of the lens. But in um, in the paper, it's not clear in the results section whether they had any complication. They said that they didn't see any vision treating. Uh, complication but you know like this is a very uh, large term and I would like to see some information about the vault of the lens uh, and uh, if there was some IOP spikes and how did they manage to control it uh, do you agree yeah. or yeah I, I yeah well to be honest uh, I agree with your point because uh, in the discussion the uh, the author has gone too far into describing the ICL which I felt a little bit too much information not necessary adding anything to the paper they were describing the the small hole the uh, the the flow in the central flow in the lens which was not the aim of the study because the study is not about the new version 4 icl is about the the uh, subclinical uh, outcomes uh, subclinical icl outcomes so uh, rather than doing so much information about general uh, icl parameter etc i would rather they showed what you said talking about more other parameters, especially related to safety, because they describe safety only by one element, which is the reduction of vision, that's their safety index, but they didn't describe anything about other complication possible in ICL. Not that we see complication to, that many in ICL, but I think the completeness of, of information and data, it would be nice to have all these data, and I don't think it would be, addition, uh, be too much information, be essential information in this case. Okay, thank you so much. And I have one uh, question for Professor Cummings. Uh, do you think the follow-up needs to be longer? Because, you know, like they just presented their first two years results. And uh, as Dr. Hamada says, these patients should be checked in every six months for a longer period of time. Um, how long do you think um, it might be more beneficial for us to learn about uh, the results of such a lens in uh, those patients? I think the authors themselves said that their own criticism was that um, there weren't that many patients, 60 patients in a retrospective study. This, the study follow-up time was short, so they realized those things. And especially with keratoconus, that can happen over a lifetime. You know, when we started in cross-linking in 2007, in our first year, we saw three people in their 50s that showed progression in that year. So it's not only a young people's thing, but we know over time it becomes a lot more stable. So I think they said themselves they've got to continue following these patients um, not indefinitely, because you get to a stage where, it, when we speak to patients about it, we'd say to patients that we'll be, if we meet a young patient now, it is, is, seems like they're keratoconic, but they're rubbing, and it's our first time we've seen them. That's all right. The first thing we're doing is stopping the rubbing, and we're going to see you in three months' time to see what's going on. If you've stopped the rubbing, and within the three-month time frame, you think it's getting worse, you come back sooner. That's all. You just come back earlier. And then once they've been treated potentially with cross-linking, we'll follow them every six months, maybe until they're 25, 26 years of age. Then we'll go annually up until 35, 36, and then it's sort of every two years. And by that time, people are really familiar with the symptoms and they, they're aware of it. And they've typically stopped rubbing. Um, we, in our clinic, we simply won't cross-link you if you haven't stopped rubbing. Because I'll tell you, you, you you're wasting your money. In Ireland, um, cross-linking is not really covered by insurance, so people fell out of pocket. And I'll say to them, we're going to strengthen your cornea. We'll make it two, three, four hundred percent stronger and stiffer. But if you continue rubbing, whatever we did today in theater, you're going to break down. So it's a waste of everyone's time. So you've got to stop rubbing before we start. And what we see is half of those who stop rubbing, the keratoconus reverses and they, they flatten slightly. We don't cross-link them. So we typically use cross-linking for progressive keratoconus. And on the odd occasion, someone who's really had a bad outcome on one eye um, if they've got a, an eye that's lifting quite well with an early keratoconus, because we can do epi on and it's got a, such a high safety profile, then we would cross-link just to, to buy that security. But regular cross-linking we're doing for progressive keratoconus. Um, can I ask, uh, Arthur, if you have a keratoconic, progressive keratoconic patient, how soon after cross-linking would you do the um, ICL plant? That's a really good question, Sama. It depends on how you do it. So. In the past, we used to do all our cross-linking epi off, mm -hmm. and there sometimes you have to wait for up to five years. I mean, we used to saw people's corneas flatten for five years. In fact, I have one patient who flattened for seven years, and we did a regular 
cross-linking, I didn't expect any refractive change. He went from something like minus seven. At one stage, he was pretty close to emetropia. He thought I was some rock star. And two years later, he was plus two, you know, and then <laughs> the love had gone. He just kept on flattening. So what we do nowadays, especially with keratoconics, well, with keratoconics we're also trying to do vision correction. I do it epi on. So epi on gets very good stability, and we don't get these funny changes, these, these unpredictable refractive changes or um, corneal flattening changes. Excellent. So would you give it like a year before you do cross uh, ICL after the cross linking? After epi off. Of, uh, epi, yeah, both both options. What epi on? Do? I would do after six months. I've got seven years experience with it now. Wait. It's incredibly stable. Yeah, I'd, I'd have no no problem with an epi off. I'd probably wait a bit longer and see what the response was initially. I think in the first mm -hmm. few months you get some uh, masking of the effect because of epithelial remodeling. And mm -hmm. I think you'd want to see once the epithelium sort of settled, which is probably six months, and then see what it does going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do decide to implant, because a patient can be in a position where they're sort of stuck, one eye is normal, they can't wear a lens, they, they're bothered by the anosomotropia, then what you might do is implant a lens and purposely aim for a target of minus one and a half or minus two, anticipating mm -hmm. some potential flattening. And if it eventually settles and doesn't flatten totally, you've got a very small PRK to do to pick up the difference. Yeah. To be honest, one, one thing that always I bring in the discussion with patients going for keratoconic, going for ICL, or even subclinical, because if they're cross-linked, worries me about future change, as you just mentioned that. Right? And two, what if cross-linking fail? Because we know you could have failure after three years, start to show those failures, et cetera, especially if they're young ones. Uh, or, as you said, eye rubbers. So, so that's what sometimes worries me because their refractive stability will change after they have the lens. So I always put like a, a phrase when I consent them and inform them about the procedure that there is a, there's a higher than average chance to do I, ICL exchange or do a top-up, topo-guided treatment. Um, but that's, uh, that's always, I bring the discussion because uh, as we know that they might suddenly, they, they gone for a few years and come back and they have a more myopic progression or astig more astigmatism. That's a very valid point. Very, very valid yeah. point. And can I ask actually for both of you, in your clinical experience, what are the complications and explanation reasons in rates after ICL implantation for any group of patients, not specifically for keratoconus? Mr. Cummings? We've been really, really blessed. You know, the first time I started using ICL was in 97, way, way, way back and had no central port. We used them very infrequently, maybe three, four cases a year. And that was in South Africa. When I moved to Ireland, um, we weren't doing that and started doing it again we probably, when I started in fake lenses again, went to the artism and the artiflex. That just made more sense at that point. But the moment the ICL came with the central flow and the safety index just went, you know, to where it is now, we started using it um, as I go to I go to fake lens. And thus far, we have not we have not replaced one, not one. So we've been very lucky with sizing. I think sizing has got better over time. I think the central flow is very forgiving. If the lens is slightly large, there's still a port for aqueous to flow. And if the lens is slightly small for that eye, you still don't get crystalline lens touch because you have flow over the lens through the port. So it almost floats on the lens. So it's actually become very forgiving. Um, I think the only time I can really catch you is with, with Torix. We, we're a member of a group um, of refractive surgeons globally who are on a very active forum. And it seems like with Torix ICL, you might get up to 7% that might rotate slightly. And if they keep on moving around, there's some, you know, tricks you can do to reposition it. But with the toric, you can't really. Um, once it becomes stable, you may do a PRK or a LASIK to pick up the difference, or you can try and reposition it. Um, so those are conversations we have, too, with someone where we've got a concern. I know I once heard Yoga Alio speak about ICL, because most of us, if we want to do a fake implant now, we're doing an ICL in a, in a keratoconic. And he said in the keratoconic, he might be more inclined, in fact, to use an iris clip lens because you could actually clip it and you're not going to get these surprises. He had some concerns about keratoconic eyes and ciliary sulcuses being slightly different to a, you know, a, a normal eye where there could be more movement. Um, we haven't noticed it yet, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's a point worth bearing in mind, I guess. My concern with an iris clip would be, especially for someone who hasn't broken the habit of rubbing, is you know, that's a bigger risk. Yeah. And you, Mr. Hamad? Yeah. Yeah, well, to be honest, I have to say blessed as well, maybe, <laughs> or, or, or the design of the lens okay. is great. Because again, with the central flow, to be honest, I have to say, 
you ask me a general question. If you talk about keratoconus myopic, we have only one exchange, and that's purely because the sizing issue. Mm -hmm. Apart, but with the hyperbic different story, because you don't have the the bless of having central flow ICLs, and then you start having issues with the pressure and the bolting and and the, all the other stories. But if you talk about myopic group, very very safe. In fact, when I consent the patient, uh, I'll tell them go through all this list of complications that could happen, and I tell the same. But actually, nothing happened in my cases for six, seven years, and looks like right. Okay, so why are you telling me all this, scaring me <laughs> with all this of complication? But we have to say that. But uh, reality is uh, exactly uh, toricity. Yes, if you have a bit of uh, rotation, and I have to say I have been lucky. They've been very stable to be honest. Uh, toric ICLs, um, the exchange for the vault, but nothing else. You don't get pressure issues. I haven't seen any single cataract patient uh, cataract after the ICL. So pretty safe, I have to say, with the uh, different story when you talk about the hypropia, because they have a shallower ACs and there is no central flow lens. I wish they have a central flow because I think that makes a big, big difference to the practice. Mm. And um, say you implant an ICL for a keratoconic patient, uh, subclinical, let's say, and they progress down the line, what do you do in that case? Good question. <laughs> well, I have to say, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <It's> the consent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I think if they start to progress, obviously you have to think two things. One uh, is going to progress when, first of all, they use some of the benefit. So the anxiety, first of all, that they lost the benefit of the vision correction. So you have to go through then when I want to make this cornea stable first of all, and then deal with the vision correction after that, because this patient be enjoying pretty good vision and they don't accept now less. And that's what happened patient when they have this level of good vision, they forget where they started and they start to think that this is what should be the always the case. Uh, anyhow, so, uh, so definitely if this progressive keratoconus, I have to do cross-linking but they have to understand there might be change in the refraction now, flattening cornea. Uh, I'm glad to hear from Arthur today about the EP-ON stability quicker and long-term, which actually more, very encouraging, to be honest. Um, but yes, cross link first. And then after that, once we have to be very careful and meet, uh, try to meet patient expectation, not to overpromise, we have to ask them to wait till the cornea is stable. Then we think about what next. And this is a big question here. I mean, I'm talking theory because luckily we didn't have any patient in that situation. But I would, I would think you have two options. Option one to do ICL exchange, quite more invasive. Uh, option two is to do a, a laser vision correction uh, as long as the parameters allow. And uh, and I think Arthur might here help me with that because he's uh, he's a the guru in, in this case is the treatment and, and those patients with irregular corneas, irregular uh, uh, shape. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree. I agree with what you've said. Um, I just want to tell you one thing. I've removed one ICL, first time ever, only in the last month or so, from a patient who is not one of my patients. A patient who came in, she's sort of 55, had a cataract surgery in the one eye, she was minus 10. And obviously at the time that the surgery was done one year ago, the other eye was, was clear. And so an ICL was placed. And the patient came back to me and said, something's wrong with the ICL eye. And I looked and I said, we have a cataract. And she said, well, why didn't they do a cataract operation a year ago? And I said, well, you obviously didn't have a cataract. And an eye was a lot safer in a minus 10 eye than removing a lens, as we all know, from a detachment point of view. So I sent it back to the referring, not the referring, but the doctor that she came from. But for whatever reason, he couldn't do it. So she came back to me, and I removed the ICL about a month ago, I can, and then did the cataract. I cannot tell you how simple it was. I don't know if you ever used the cache lens years ago. That lens is just as simple to remove from the eye. So an, I think an ICL exchange is a lot easier than what, you would, than what you think. I don't like lens exchanges either. But it came out so easily, and I could imagine simply putting a new one in would be, you know, no different to what would normally be the case. I don't think it's very difficult. I'd be looking at why they've changed the, the age will play a very big role. You have an axial length from your, your, your previous refractive um, measurements, so you'll know if there's actually elongation. You might know if there's any nuclear sclerosis. So depending on the cause, you'd make the right call. And um, if the cornea is progressing, um, 
that's quite unlikely in, in our situation when you're doing this properly because as we discussed earlier, we're not really going to be doing ICLs in, in cases where we expect progression. We're going to wait for some level of stability. So that would be quite unusual. But if it was, you have no choice but to go and um, cross-link. And then once you've got, it depends on how much tissue you have. So we don't want to do any laser on someone who's not 25. We just have some mental thing about them being slightly older, cornea slightly stiffer. And um, then if, if the amount of tissue you're going to be using is not too much, is not more than 40, 50 microns, and the cornea can tolerate that, then what we used to do way back would be um, a simultaneous laser cross-linking. But that gave us these incredible surprises in terms of what the refraction could do. So now what we do is we do a topography guided PRK, correct that very small error, and then in fact we follow them and would wait to cross-link if any sign arose that the cornea wasn't stable. So, and the funny thing is, in many karyotoconics, karyotoconics we treat that way. So our, our simultaneous cross-linking now starts with a topography guided PRK, um, following them to see when we should cross-link. Of course, someone who's been progressing, we've got a cross-link. And we'd normally cross-link anything from three weeks afterwards. Epi-on. Epi-on is, the recovery is, at most, the first afternoon, maybe a bit of burning and scratching. So it's, it's really nothing, um, it doesn't really make it too epithelial off procedures in, in short succession. Mm -hmm. Good. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. I would like to ask one final question for uh, Professor Cummings. Because uh, beforehand, before our discussion, I asked whether you were using any um, other technology than topography or tomography to detect uh, these uh, eyes under more risk. Uh, would you like to talk about it? How do you conduct your uh, evaluation? I will, and a professor of Amara can do it too. He's doing the same thing. Is So I think anyone who started using epithelial mapping has realized that it's a very, very valuable tool. Um, it's probably more sensitive than any other tool we have. And it's also a very helpful therapeutic tool. So if you decide for a keratoconic to do a, a simultaneous, but three weeks apart kind of thing, where you're doing a topo guided procedure followed by cross-linking, you can use the epithelium to your advantage by doing a trans-epithelial topo-guided procedure. And then you get fantastic normalization of the cornea and then cross-link um, a little while later. But epithelial maps are, are fantastic. So I would think that it's got to be close to 80%. I, I can't tell you scientifically, but anecdotally, 80% of patients that I see with a BAD that's just over 1.55, so just becoming yellow, and it's saying this could be a keratoconic, and then we're thinking we're not doing LASIK on this patient. Um, we then go look at the epi maps, and eight out of ten times the epi map actually shows a thickening over the, the area of elevation on the on the tomography, and not a thinning. So most of those are actually artifacts. They're not. So you can safely go and do a LASIK. You know, the, there is no keratoconus. So in our practice, there's no doubt that epithelial maps have become the most sensitive, the most sensitive test. I'm sure you find the same, Simon. Actually, it's funny you saying that, Arthur, because today I have the patient who got uh, bad D is um, 1.65, just yellow, right? And uh, so the, the, my optometrist said he's not suitable. And I said, go do corneal epithelium map. And surprise, surprise, as if you're describing the case, 65 thickness of the epithelium inferior above the, uh, well, that's where the area showed and on the topography that's abnormal. So actually, bad D was bad, <laughs> did not help, did not help me really to, uh, to diagnose. Well, epithelium mapping definitely made clear that actually this is all artifact and we discussed the laser uh, uh, treatment with the patient. So yes, agree 100%. Epithelium mapping makes a huge difference to our practice for sure. Artemis, every patient. Artemis, you and Bazak, if you have a paper at some point in the future on epithelial mapping, you should ask Dan Reinstein to, mm. to be your expert. He understands epithelial mapping backwards. And it's so interesting how he, he told me something years ago that I didn't understand. I mean, we know that the epithelium responds to what's happening below the cornea. So if you get a, a, a foreign body in the eye and you take out the rust ring, and there's a real defect in the cornea, because it's such an acute change, the epithelium completely covers it and will be completely smooth. If you have a very gentle slope from a wide zone PRK, epithelium tends to be, it doesn't really tend to thicken centrally or thin if you're doing a hyper -oak. Um So that's the one thing, epithelium responds to what's happening below it. But the other thing epithelium responds to 
is the template that your lid creates. So your eyelid's blinking between 10 and 14,000 times a day, and epithelium sort of creates a shape that's the perfect fit between the stroma and this eyelid template. And that's why you see in some patients, they might have more pressure on the superior part of the globe or the superior part of the cornea, and the whole day long, they, they're moving epithelium down to the bottom part, and then you get this positive on BADD, and you find on epithelial mapping is just thicker epithelium. That's a really, really useful tool. So that is a good idea for uh, the researchers, for the young trainee, to go to the uh, oculoplastic clinic and start doing corneal topography for those patients with abnormal eyelids and get uh, to see what kind of epithelial maps you get. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> we have plenty of those. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I actually think we can talk for hours because it's, uh, yeah. it's a very interesting discussion, uh, but I think uh, we're running out of time, so I'm afraid I will have to uh, wrap up. So, Bazak, do you want to run the final poll for us? Sure. Can, sure. can we have the questions for the final poll, please? Uh, our first question is, after discussing today's article, would you like to proceed with ICL implantation in eyes with keratoconus? Yes, no. Or do you need more long-term data to decide? We are missing keratoconus here. <laughs> Subclinical keratoconus. I, I, mm. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> you need more data. Okay. Yeah, fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we proceed? That tells you they are safe. Yeah. Yeah. After today's discussion, are you willing to include more diagnostic devices in your practice to detect cases under the risk of ectasia? After our final discussion. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, and our last question, please. Has today's discussion made the distinction clearer for you for terms like keratoconus suspect, borderline KC, subclinical KC, form frost KC, or early KC? We learned that they are very close. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. We can do this again, <laughs> just to complete the other portion too. <laughs> right, so I just want to wrap up by thanking all of you, Basak, uh, Mr. Cummings and Mr. Hamada. Thank you, it was a great pleasure to have all of you tonight. We had a fantastic discussion, I think. We learned a lot. And um, just uh, for our audience, thank you for uh, being with us tonight. And uh, a recording of this episode will be available within 24 hours. And... Um, if you want to uh, save the date as well uh, for the next, let me show you this. So if you want to save the date for our next session, which is on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, and uh, the registration link will follow. Right. Thank you, all of you, and have a lovely evening or night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Very much.